Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. On April 25th, 1993, a million people descended on Washington, D.C. to march for queer liberation. Gathering with other participants in a pre-march service that morning were two exquisitely dressed African-American musicians. She wore a pale yellow ensemble, including gloves with matching crown. Surprised to see this elegant heterosexual couple in the ragtag mix of a whole lot of gay, I went to greet them. What brings you here today, I asked, meaning what on earth could have compelled you to get up this early on a Saturday morning to hang out with the likes of us? And she answered, oh, we remember that you were here, meaning you Unitarian Universalists, you queer people, we remember that you were here when we marched with Martin. We embraced then in tears, and I pray I remember those words for the rest of my life. This is how to be a good ally. The service was underway when moments before it was time for the sermon, there was a small commotion at the front door of All Souls Church. Someone motioned for me to remain seated. Suddenly, people were scrambling to set up folding chairs in the front pews. And then, there down the center aisle came a small, majestic throng of people, two by two. It was the entire board of the Unitarian Universalist Association led by the president and moderator of the UUA. They had been meeting here in Boston when they voted to temporarily adjourn their meeting, fly to Washington, and reconvene at our worship service. This is how to be a good ally. To be an ally is to use whatever privilege we can whatever we can muster to be a collaborator or even a co-conspirator in the struggle for justice, equity, and belonging. We can speak up about our values, donate money and time, learn more, take responsibility to educate ourselves. That's foundational. The strategy is to dismantle injustice from every possible angle, including systemically. We can act individually and collectively, remembering that the impact of a group can be greater than the sum of its parts. And we should ask individuals whose lives we're praying to improve if we're doing it right. A white male program director at Lockheed Martin had all good intentions of supporting the work of a black female employee. He instructed her to bring a little swagger and attitude to a client pitch. And she responded, I can't do that. And she was right, of course. In no way could she get by with behaving like that. Behaving as he did. He describes it as an aha moment. He got the view and owned his privilege. Lesson learned. This is how to be a good ally. One morning, sometime in the early 1980s, someone brought me the Boston Globe, and 
There above the fold of the metro section was a photo of my sister, Lisa. Yes, that was definitely she. She was wearing the sweater. I'd brought her from Ireland. But I couldn't parse the caption. Apparently, something homophobic had pushed a lot of people over the edge, and my shy, straight little sister had organized a crowd of students at Bates College to occupy the president's office. This is how to be a good ally. Forty years later, for Mother's Day, our youngest daughter, Jessie, gave Cam and me a fabulous photo of herself with her gay boyfriend, Keenan, modeling for the No Hate campaign. When asked why she had chosen to donate her services to No Hate, detonating a slew of stereotypes, she responded, I come from a gay family. The men in the photos in my baby book are dead with AIDS. This campaign is about my life. This is how to be a good ally. And why do we do it? Why do we show up as allies? Yes, it's the right thing to do. Yes, it's resonant with our deepest values and aspirations. But more than that, always more, we do it for love. Gamble everything for love, wrote the 13th century Persian Sufi mystic Rumi. Gamble everything for love. If you are a true human being, gamble everything for love. If not, leave this gathering. Half-heartedness doesn't reach into majesty. In a beautiful piece for the Huffington Post, a global policy strategist, innovator, and entrepreneur named Samir Mansur writes, Dhaka, Bangladesh's notorious traffic brought me a gift. In the midst of the dizzying motor madness, rendering immobile among the thousands of honking cars, clamoring rickshaws, and throngs of people, an ancient verse of graffitied poet unfurled itself into view. Every day I would pass that poetry inscribed on a vandalized wall and linger by it at a snail's pace until its message occupied a permanent place in my being. It said, gamble everything for love. The message is clear, our heart is a source of intuition, and it knows the path to personal happiness. In our love, in our work, and in our service to others, our heart serves as an internal compass, guiding us toward our highest aspirations. It's up to us to quiet our minds, make out which direction the compass is pointing, and still our lives just enough to hear that directional beat. There are those who may tell us otherwise how irrational, unrealistic, and risky the path may be, but what do they know of the mysterious organ at the center of our being? It speaks only to us. It's up to us, Samir Mansur concludes. If we want to listen to its guidance, if we want to roll the dice on what we know, risk our sense of security in pursuit of our heart's directives, the choice is never easy. But here's a reassuring little secret Rumi didn't mention. The game is always rigged in our favor. In the pursuit of the heart's deepest desires, we not only fulfill our highest aspirations, but aspirations for the world. The two are one and the same. If we listen and play by the rules of the heart, then our journey will inevitably lift us and those around us into majesty. Gamble everything for love. This is how to be a good ally. Women, people of color, 
refugees and immigrants, people with disabilities, queer people, Muslims, Jews, whatever you aren't, you can be an ally for someone who is. The work is to make ourselves available, listen generously, empathize, and validate others' experiences. If you've done the work, let people know they can count on you. Sociologist Dr. Tsidel M. Milaku, author of You Don't Look Like a Lawyer, Black Women and Systemic Gendered Racism, did research that proved that black women who progressed at their law firms had trusting relationships with white male partners who were sincerely interested in furthering their careers. One of them said, one of the women said, what I most appreciated about him was that he always made time for me and encouraged me to stop by and see him despite how busy he was. This is how to be a good ally. In May of 1992, gang violence broke out in Mattapan's Morningside Baptist Church during a funeral for Robert Odom, who was at a dance party when he was gunned down in a drive-by shooting. Inside the church, there had been a stabbing, and there were bullet holes in the sanctuary walls. A bright line had been crossed. On May 18th, the call went out for the city's clergy to gather and strategize about the ending of the killing of our youth. I walked in and found myself one of precious few women and the only white person. My friend Graylin Hagler, black and male, made his way through the crowd, greeted me warmly, and put a hand on my shoulder. She's with me, he told our colleagues. This is how to be a good ally. The second March on Washington for Queer Rights was on October 11th, 1987. I landed at National Airport with a plane full of gay men in wheelchairs, at least two able-bodied friends apiece, and all the medicine and equipment that traveled then with someone living with AIDS. In those pre-9-11 days, you could just give your plane ticket to someone if you couldn't make your flight, and they could take it in your place. We had already gone through two iterations on most of the tickets with people dying before the big day being replaced by the newly diagnosed. The logistics of pulling off this trip cannot be overstated. Mostly, of course, they wanted to see the AIDS quilt spread out on the National Mall, but we also took to the streets hundreds of wheelchairs to lead that march. We wanted people to see what AIDS looked like, and the whole world was watching. That was also the march where Kem and her affinity group were arrested in front of the Supreme Court as ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, received its first national coverage. This is how to be a good ally. When she chaired our board, the Prudential Committee, Arlington Street's Marianne Hardenberg, taught us to ask, always, always ask, who should be at this table but isn't? What perspective aren't we hearing? On our way to getting them there, they should be in our minds and in our hearts. And if they're there, hallelujah. Invite those voices, step out of the spotlight, and decenter yourself. And whether or not members of the marginalized group are in the room, practice interrupting the conversation if it goes south. Listen for the telltale, she didn't mean what she said to be hurtful, or he's being too sensitive. Ask, would we be having this conversation about a straight, cisgender, able-bodied young white man? Ask it. This is how to be a good ally. I've told you this story before, just one more. 
18 years ago, the weekend after Kem and I were finally legally married, I was waiting in line at a deli counter in Chatham on Cape Cod. The oldest member of the founding family of Chatham, Mr. Eldridge, came in and stood just behind me. I was in running clothes. He was wearing a seersucker suit and bow tie. We'd never met, but he struck up a conversation. I'm here to get coleslaw. They have the best coleslaw on Cape Cod. Do you like coleslaw? <laughs> I thought, this is it. You're legally married. Change one little word and change the world. Say it. I'm not much for coleslaw, I told him, but my wife loves it. <laughs> oh, God, I said wife to Mr. Eldridge. <laughs> it seemed to me then that everything stopped at the deli counter. It got very, very quiet in Chatham, Massachusetts. Old Mr. Eldridge looked me up and down, thinking perhaps he had mistaken me for a woman. You could almost see the gears grinding as the paradigm shifted. Your wife? Another pause. Years passed. Well, then, he said, if your wife likes coleslaw, you should get her some of this. <laughs> this is how to be a good ally. Beloved spiritual companions, just this then. Be a good ally. Do it for love and reach into majesty. Happy Pride. And now for our benediction, I'm going to invite you to put your hand over your heart in Namaste. I bow to the divine in you. You are divine. Adapted from English singer, songwriter, and drummer Phil Collins, True Colors. I see your true colors shining through. I see your true colors, and that's why I love you. Don't be afraid to let them show. Your true colors are beautiful, like a rainbow. Let us keep this faith, beloveds, and pass it on. The service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts. I love you. Happy Pride. Amen. Happy Pride, everyone. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. 
Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.